people who have the paper, you have read this. But there are many people out there who don't know what's really going on in the world. And so tonight I'm going to give them a sneak peek into the newspaper of the century. World View, an editorial by William Cooper. Nations greeted the fall of the Soviet Union with cheers. The future looked good, minus the threat of atomic war. The evil empire died, or so we thought, while our eyes were on Russia and the Eastern Bloc. Two new threats materialized, the economic power of the socialist European Union and Islamic militarism with its unpredicted alliances. In Europe, geography has always determined history. Austria's accession to the European Union sets Hungary on the border. The EU finds itself sharing a common land border with Russia, now a direct neighbor due to the accession of Finland and Sweden. A new Scandinavian and Baltic dimension to what had been a predominantly Western European formation confronts the European Union with its new challenges to the East. Despite the lack of coverage in the United States, the new power in the world is shaping up to be Germany, France, Italy, Belgium, and the other European nations. In fact, the European Union is already bigger than the United States, with around 360 million people, 100 million more than the United States. The European Union is only point. $5 trillion behind the GDP of the United States and with further expansion of its membership will soon surpass the $6.4 trillion of the U.S. I predict that a dangerous new alliance is on the horizon, an alliance more threatening to the West than the Soviet Union. With the new world capital of Marxism residing in Brussels, and the citizens of Russia pining away for their lost security in communism, a Russian-European alliance is very probable. An alliance with the European Union would solve many of Russia's most pressing problems and would give the European Union somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 million people and a GDP of about $9 trillion. While Americans continue to feel safer because of the touted victory over the evil empire, most are unaware of the great changes taking place. Already, Europe is sucking America dry by refusing to open trade in agricultural and other products. The European Union and the Japanese are protectionist, and this is already crippling America economically while allowing others to grow. An anti-American alliance is taking form. The Citizens Agency for Joint Intelligence and Intelligence Service members in Brussels, Rome, London, Moscow, and Zurich report a new European-Russian compact that would destroy the United States economy. An economic-military alliance between the European Union and Greater Russia will be the biggest challenge ever faced by the United States. The concentration of power will be the greatest in the history of the world. This combination seeks total domination just as Hitler's Nazi Germany did in the early 40s. Hitler, however, never dreamed of the strength that would be embodied in this European Union-Russian pact. Not too long ago, if you will remember, the world trembled during the attempted or was it staged coup against Gorbachev? The uncertainty of who exactly would take his place, coupled with the blared danger of the Soviet Union's nuclear warheads, was enough to worry even the most jaded. Is it time to tremble again? Boris Yeltsin is not going to remain president for long. Who will succeed him? That is one of the most important questions in world politics today. Everyone has heard of Boris Yeltsin, but very few could tell you the name of any other leading political figure in Moscow. The old guard is passing. Some have heard of Vladimir Zhirinovsky, names like Boris Nimtsov, Yegor Gaidar, Alexander Rutskoy, Grigory Yavlinsky, and Boris Fyodorov draw 
only vacant stares. If you don't believe me, look at the face of the person sitting next to you. How many of you heard those names? Russia's economy demands special attention. It is not as bleak as you have been told. On the contrary, high risk is the norm, but as anywhere else, high risk means high rewards. Car ownership has gone up by 50%. The average monthly salary rose in dollars from $8 in 1992 to $113 in October of 1994. And despite the doomsayers, the Russian people are doing better economically than anyone can remember. Their problems lie in the areas of crime and education, particularly relating to business. Russia's trade with the West is dominated by the European Union. The bulk, however, is still with other former Soviet republics. The European Union's exports to Russia were five times higher than those of the United States, and the imports were about 19 times higher from Russia than the United States. And Russia's central bank granted full license to Citibank, Chase Manhattan, Credit Suisse, ING Bank, ABN AMRO, Society Generale, Bank of China, Yapi Vecredi, and Bank Austria to compete with Dresdner, BNP, and Credit Lyonnais, who already held licenses for business in St. Petersburg. Chechnya. Chechnya is the Achilles heel in Russia's political and economic arena. The use of military might to solve a political problem is drawing fire from the leaders of the West, Americans in particular. Yeltsin's inability to solve the problem may be his downfall. His orders are sometimes ignored by his commanders. Some units have refused to fight. One general submitted his resignation. It was refused, and he was transferred to a more peaceful post. There must be a solution, and it must come soon. Chechnya is Russia's Kuwait. The main pipeline from the Caspian Sea oil wells comes inland from Makhachkala at the coast to the outskirts of Grozny. It then forks. One pipeline goes west to the Black Sea and the Russian naval base at Novorossik, and the other heads north into Russia. The two east-west railroad lines from Mazdak to Makhachkala, strategically vital to any Russian military presence in the Caucasus, runs through Chechnya and so do the main roads. Without control of the territory, Russia could no longer sustain its forces or its trade in its least stable border region. And that is why Yeltsin cannot let go of this country. You can look for possible United Nations peacekeeping action in Chechnya using United States troops. It may sound far out. But if it happens, you could anticipate United Nations peacekeeping in the United States using Russian troops. The wild card in all of this seems to be the Soviet Union's nuclear arsenal. What of the atomic and hydrogen weapons that were poised for launch against the United States? Who controls them, if anybody? Who is keeping tabs on the components to make the bombs? How do we know they are not being sold to gangbangers in Los Angeles? Some say that the long- and short-range weapons, nuclear missiles, and submarines of the old Soviet Union are the greatest threat to the world since the Cuban Missile Crises. Reports say there are anywhere from zero to as many as 35,000 atomic and hydrogen weapons floating around over there. If they don't exist, which is probable, why were we threatened with them for so many years? If they do exist, and in the larger numbers, are they being sold to the highest bidder in some alley in Casablanca? And how do we find out? And even if they are not, you must remember that Vladimir Zhirinovsky threatened to use Russia's nuclear weapons against Japan, Germany, and America. Don't dismiss this guy as just another nut. He won the 1993 Duma elections. 
With freedom came the release of repressed ethnic pride and nationalism. And you can expect to see bloody uprisings in Hungary, in Romania, and Slovakia. The Russians throughout the ex-USSR, the Turks in Bulgaria, and those are only a few of the probabilities. And one example, just one, is Yugoslavia, now called Bosnia. Last but not least is the Muslim question. Islamic extremism is a problem in Russia. For example, the Muslim republics of Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan have all been approached by Iran to supply it with ex-Soviet nuclear weapons. The rulers of these ex-Soviet republics know that if they do not do what Iran wants, then they will be swept from power by Iranian-inspired Islamic revolutionaries. And the Middle East is the easiest shot to call. The fires of Islamic extremism throughout the world have been fueled by the collapse of communism. The Ayatollahs are now telling their followers there is only one way forward for Muslims, the Islamic way. And Islamic extremism is ready to knock aside anything and everything that gets in its way, whether it is the revolutionaries in Algeria and Libya, the sheiks of Saudi Arabia, or the politicians of Turkey and Pakistan. Even worse, it is spreading into the Western world. I'm not talking about the followers of Muhammad. I'm talking about Islamic extremists, those who would die instantly to further the cause and take a million people with them if they can. There's a big difference between peaceful worshipers and these people. And ladies and gentlemen, they are very, very dangerous. For example, I cite the Muslims of Bradford and other cities in Britain to the Algerians in every city in France which was the exile home of Khomeini to Germany, Canada, and America. The Islamic madness is thinly disguised nihilism hell-bent on destroying every last vestige of Western civilization. And really scary, ladies and gentlemen, is the fact that Islam is now being armed with nuclear technology by China and Russia. They are negotiating to buy ex-Soviet nuclear weapons and scientists. Over one million ex-Soviet nuclear weapons scientists and technicians are looking for jobs outside Russia. And they're finding that Islam pays very well. Gaddafi just recently offered the top Russian atomic specialists, who traditionally earned $9 a month, $10,000 a month, to come work for him. Do you really think they will turn Colonel Gaddafi down? I don't think so. I think they will soon be making atomic bombs for Islam with the express purpose of launching a nuclear assault on Israel before the year 2000. And don't believe in these peace talks. They will fall apart and the rift will be over Jerusalem. And when it happens, the Israelis will annex the West Bank. I'm sure you can put the rest of this puzzle together. Islam intends to destroy Israel before the end of the century. The Islamic extremists will have their traditional ally, Russia, helping them. You won't hear this on the 6 o'clock news, but Russia is hedging her bets, making an alliance with the European Union and also with the Islamic nations under the table. Russia and Islam, in alliance with the South African ANC, have planned a strategic raw materials blockade against the West. Russia and Kazakhstan have applied to join OPEC, and you won't hear that on the 6 o'clock news either. This will give OPEC over 50% of the world's oil production and over 80% of the world's known oil reserves. Vital raw materials such as chromium are virtually monopolized by South Africa. The ANC will link up with the Islamic Arab Empire to control all of the continent. Our sources tell us that the ANC is moving all its bank accounts to the Islamic Bank. If they can pull this off, the West
Will this happen? If the past, ladies and gentlemen, is a window up on the future, the answer, the answer, ladies and gentlemen, is yes. 